love to have you. So um, just a little quiz based on the scripture that Vicki just read for us. Does God expect us to come with arm loads of offerings? Does God expect us to sacrifice our firstborn child for repentance? No. No. And as I was engaging the scripture passages this week and thinking about this topic, I came to realize that, you know what? For some of us this morning, that might be all that we need to hear. <laughs> Depending on what our experience with religion has been. So often our ideas of religion, because of how we've been taught and how we've been formed, are that God wants to and God needs to extract something from us. That there's something that we have to do. That there's someone that we have to be other than who we are for God to accept us. And yet, in this passage from Micah this morning, we are reminded that God requires no such thing. And so maybe you can pack up and leave right now. But as we continue this conversation about money that we've been engaged in over the past three weeks, I'm going to talk a little bit about so. So what do we do? We've, we've been talking about the spiritual practice of money. And um, my clicker isn't coming up, Vicki, so I might have to ask you to, to, click, to click slides for me. And so we've looked at our spiritual lives, which we talk quite a bit about in our community, and how sometimes that's divorced from one of the things that we spend the most time with. So we're going to leave here this afternoon and maybe we'll go to lunch or we'll, we'll go to the store and we're gonna pull, maybe, a few of us, will pull cash out of our wallets in order to, to pay for that. Well, oh, you know what, I'm back on, so we're good, thank you. Others of us will pull credit cards out of our wallets to pay for that. We're always involved. We're always engaging money. And so a couple of weeks ago, we kind of stepped back a little bit and, and thought about our relationship with money. Last week, we talked about the really important concept of abundance or sufficiency and scarcity and some of the lies that we've been told about this this idea of scarcity this sunday we're going to look at who we claim to be as people of god those that are answering god's call to practice faith and mercy and justice in community and that comes from Micah 6, 8 that Vicki just read for us. God doesn't need or want all of these things from us. God wants us to walk humbly and to practice mercy and to practice justice. It's an idea that Jesus came up with himself. Reflecting on this passage, Micah, talking about the religious leaders of his day, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe your mint, your dill, and your cumin, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. So we see here Jesus taking this even a little bit farther and saying tithing isn't even the point. The point is practicing faith and mercy and justice. So just for a few moments this morning, I want to talk a little bit about how do we practice 
faith, mercy, and justice. So how do we practice this that we claim we're called to do and called to be with this that takes up a huge chunk of our lives and our energy, our money? We're called to practice using our money faithfully. This passage from Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You simply can't serve both. The understanding of Hebrew spirituality was was based on the great Shema, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul and our strength. And we do that not because that's what good religious people do or good Christian people do. We do that because we step back and we recognize that this is the way that life works best. When we are giving our attention and our practice to the idea of that in which all is one, that which we call God. And so here's Jesus and Jesus' ultimate wisdom saying, you know what, you can't do that. You can't serve both God and wealth. And this connotation of wealth is kind of a mysterious word in Hebrew, the, in Aramaic, the word that Jesus actually used was, was mammon. And the idea, the implication behind that was ill-gotten wealth. And ill-gotten wealth, especially in this time, in this place, in which is a theme through all of Scripture, ill-gotten wealth is wealth that we have a lot of when other people are hungry and other people are suffering. In fact, the idea of wealth, especially in the time when Hebrew Scripture was written, would have been a complete anomaly. Because why would one person have more than someone else? Especially if that someone else didn't have enough to eat, didn't have enough to live on, didn't have enough to survive. So Jesus is taking this idea of our lives work best when we focus our attention and our energies and our practice on the one, the one true God. And so that was a new idea in the time of Hebrew scriptures because there were all sorts of gods. And of course, we claim now that, well, we understand that there not, aren't all sorts of gods. We believe in one God. Do we? Sometimes that pursuit of wealth, that pursuit of more and more, that pursuit of security in the face of the lies of scarcity, so oftentimes becomes that which we worship. Spiritual teachers throughout the ages have let us know that the pursuit of that results in death, results in the destruction of those, especially on the margins. When we step back and we look at who we are as a society and whether or not that matches the values that we all hold dear, I think we could do a lot worse than going back and saying and seeing who is it, what is it that we worship? Because if we worship the pursuit of wealth, not only does this become our idol, 
but it leads to other idols as well. The worship of political leaders. The worship of those that promise that they can give us what we want. We can't serve both God and other idols. We can't serve both God and other and God and mammon. Another important principle in our faith walk is this that our spiritual lives involve the ability to release and to let go. And we get that from the life and ministry of Jesus himself. Let the same mind be in you. That's you and that's me. Be that was in Christ Jesus who emptied himself. And again, that's not just some religious rule that we follow just because. It's because that's how our spiritual lives, that's how our lives work best. I think so often we walk around like this, holding tight to the things that we think that we have and not wanting to let go and not wanting to let anyone have those. The spiritual life is not this posture. The spiritual life, the life that matters, is this posture. Letting go. Letting go of those angers. Letting go of those judgments. Letting go of those resources that we think that we have to hold on to so tightly. And in that letting go, we are filled with the wonders and the beauty and everything that God has for us and God wants for us. So we practice faith with our money. We also have the opportunity to practice mercy with our money. Not just the opportunity as people of faith, but the, but the pretty strong instruction throughout Scripture. This is a passage from Acts, which is the story of the early church. And so this is at the end of the second chapter of Acts. So Acts 2, if you remember, is Pentecost, when the Spirit of God comes upon the people. And Peter was preaching, and people were responding, and the church, the way, was growing. And so look at what one of the results of that was. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. In that faith community, there was no one that was lacking. I'm so proud of us as a congregation because we're really good at practicing mercy. We're really good at seeing needs in our small church community. We're good at seeing needs in our larger community in providing for those needs. Whether that be the Compass Community Center and in providing for the needs of LGBTQ youth or rest in peace medical debt. Remember that from a couple of, couple of years ago where we wiped out over $800,000 in medical debt that people were carrying. Every Tuesday night, we share a meal and a shower and a pantry and clothes and haircuts with folks that need it in our community. We're really good at practicing that. We started to get stories back of how you used that $110 that we all received a couple weeks ago. And the stories of mercy are wonderful. Lynn Serator let me know. She, she came up to me and she said, well, well I doubled our, my money. 
And I got really excited. I thought she went to the track or something. And I said, you know, maybe, maybe we should come up with a, a, a horse betting committee or something like that and see what money we can make. But that's not what she meant. She doubled it. She took her 110 and added 110 to that. And this past Tuesday night, she gave everyone that came to, all of the guests that came to dine, $5 for them to use. Janet Lyle took her $110 and she's been partitioning it into, into envelopes. And, and Janet is a woman after my own heart. She goes out to eat a lot. So um, what she's been doing is on top of the normal tip that she writes in on her receipt, she's giving them a portion, the servers that are making $2, $3 an hour outside of their tips, giving them an extra portion of that $110 on top of what she already tips. What just an amazing way to show mercy. What an amazing way to affect change in the world. Just like it was unthinkable in biblical times for someone to have more wealth it was oftentimes unthinkable in biblical times for those that did not have enough because resources were shared. How might our world be different? How might our lives be different if we practiced mercy with our money? We practice faith, we practice mercy, we practice justice. Over and over again in Scripture, we're let in on the fact that, especially for the people of Israel, justice was built into their way of doing things, their way of life, their law. So often we go gleaning and some members of our congregation are involved in gleaning every, every weekend during the gleaning season. And gleaning, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, is going out into a field and um, either that's already been picked or that won't be picked for some reason in picking that produce and getting that to food banks so that folks that are food insecure in Palm Beach County can have some fresh vegetables and sometimes some fresh fruit with the food that they are provided. Just an incredible ministry and it helps, it helps agricultural producers in Palm Beach County and um, faith communities are the people that have the, the woman power and the manpower to do that. So it just, it's just so beneficial to, to everyone. But that's not something that was just come up with um, over in the past few years. It's something that's been practiced from the very beginning of our understanding of ourselves as people on this spiritual journey. In the very law of the people of Israel, they were told it's not about taking everything that you can. In fact, here's what you need to do as you're, as you're producing, as you're growing your crops, as people came from becoming nomadic and hunters and gatherers to becoming agriculturally based societies. Here's what you need to do. You need to pick your harvest, but you don't pick all the way up to the edge. You don't grab everything that you possibly can. Here's what you do. You leave behind some for the folks that don't have that land on which to produce. You leave behind some so that everybody is fed. The way society works best is not us all grabbing and accumulating everything that we can. The way society works best is when everybody has enough. That's the bottom line. So different so often from how we understand ourselves to be. I remember a couple years ago, 
not having one of my best days and I got into an argument with someone, um, which happens more often than I would like. We were just, it's when the, remember when the self, and some of y'all don't because because good for you, you might not go to McDonald's, but it's when McDonald's introduced the self-serve kiosks. And for some reason, we started having a conversation about that, and this is also when there is a lot of discussion around minimum wage being raised uh, to $15. And this person's point was, you know, people are going to be asking for $15, and McDonald's is just going to put in these self-serve kiosks, um, and then they won't have a job at all. And so first of all, that wasn't true because self-service kiosks are a disaster. And then also, our bottom line isn't how much we can make. As people of faith, the bottom line is how well are we taking care of one another? How well are we loving God and loving each other? Jason, that's naive. That's not the way the world works. Why isn't that the way the world works? We're the world. We can change the way that we participate in these systems. With the resources we have, we can take a stand. Archimedes, the ancient mathematician and philosopher. Do you remember what he said? Give me a place to stand and I can move the world. Now he was talking about levers, of course, but I think it's a great principle for life. You know, I think sometimes we get confused about what we should be doing with the resources that we have and maybe we have the question backwards. Maybe it's a matter of figuring out what is it that we value? Where is it that we take our stand in employing our resources that way, directing our resources that way, both in what we give and what we contribute to and in how we use our money? What is it that we're purchasing? And with those powerful purchasing dollars, are we participating in systems that keep folks living in poverty? Are we participating in systems that continue to degrade the earth environment? Or are we using those powerful dollars to build people up and to take care of our planet? So here's an ideal of how we might practice faith, mercy, and justice. Are any of us doing all of those things? No, of course not. Because doing all of those things is hard. And doing all of those things perfectly are impossible. But remember from the beginning, God is not calling us to be perfect. God is not calling us to be coming with armloads of offerings and our firstborn child. In the words of one of our favorites, Mary Oliver, you don't have to be good. You don't have to walk across the desert on your knees, repenting. We're called to practice. So here is a practical, spiritual idea for practicing these things. Not getting it perfectly, but practicing. The idea of the practice of the tithe. And you'll think, well, Jason, you just said tithing's not the point. And tithing isn't a point, but it is a practice. Tithing in scriptural times was taking 10% of whatever came in and putting that back out. 
And in the time when the idea of tithing came to be, it served a practical purpose. In this beginning of an agrarian society, people that had land had food. If you didn't have land, you didn't have food. Who didn't have land? Women, children, and Levites or priests. So part of Jewish law was every third year you shall bring out that full tithe of your produce for that year and store it within your towns. The Levites, because they have no allotment, those are the priests of inheritance with you, as well as the resident aliens. Oh my goodness, we're supposed to be sharing our tithe with the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows in your towns. If we're tithing, if that, if that percentage is going out, then they can come and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you in all of the work that you undertake. Tithing is practice. Tithing is not a rule. Tithing is not a law. Does it need to be 10%? No, it doesn't have to be 10%. It has to be a percentage, or it can be a percentage, that you're comfortable practicing with. So that we can practice this idea of being faithful with our money. Practice letting go, which is really, really hard. And that's why we have to practice. We can practice mercy. We can practice justice. Tithing is not the point. It is the practice. It's a concept that's been misused by religious leaders all throughout history. You have to give your 10% and you have to bring it here. No, it's a practice. You and God choose that amount together. You and God choose where that goes. Part of the taxes that we pay and income taxes can be included in this because there is a percentage, there is a very small percentage of what we pay in taxes that goes to provide for the medical needs and the safety and the security of others. The great predominance of our tax dollars goes to defense, so-called defense and military but a little bit of it does go to the practice of mercy and the practice of justice. That can be included in our tithe, especially if we're keeping that in mind as we're we're writing out our check in April or earlier. What is it that you value? What is it that's important to you? Where is it that you can stand and move the world? Where is it that we can stand and move the world? That's a little bit more difficult when we're doing that together. But as people of relative affluence, as people that together have a few dollars in the bank, where is it that we might stand? and move the world? Where is it that we might stand in solidarity and come alongside people and be with people and journey with people and better enable them to find their own destiny and way of being? I think those are exciting questions. These are things that we don't talk about a whole lot. It's it's uncomfortable talking about money. And yet, we have this tool right in front of us, right at our disposal to make the world a better place. In the words of Jesus, to participate in abundant life, the life that is worth living for ourselves 
and for the world. Let's pray together.